Hey, Ben. Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully we can get to uh, let everybody know we're starting. Uh, Krista. Hey, Krista. Would you mind letting people know that are in the... Uh, um, thank you very much <laughs> that we are going to get good morning, uh, get going this morning. So welcome uh, to uh, the half day of Southwest uh, um, Surgical Congress um, and uh, joining us for the Thomas Hoare lecture on uh, uh, today. And then we'll have a session on subtotal co cholecystectomy and then the uh, American College of Surgeons uh, session this morning. Uh, after those, uh, the afternoon events are uh, golf, some free time. There's some yard games that they have set up uh, for everybody to do some networking um, out on one of the lawns. And I can't remember, uh, didn't look at the program where that is. Um, all the scientific sessions are being live streamed and recorded. The recordings will be available for 90 days. Uh, please claim your CME and self-assessment credits by May 19th. Uh, you may claim them uh, through the CME on the uh, app. Uh, we're proud to announce that the Southwest uh, Surgical Congress can accept tax deducted donations. Uh, funds will be used for education and research. Um, you may donate directly through the meeting app or stop by the uh, registration desk if you uh, desire to uh, donate to the Lowry Fund. We encourage all attendees to visit the industry supporters during the breaks and in the exhibit halls um, hours. The Southwest Congress wishes uh, um, especially to recognize uh, one of the sponsors, our gold sponsors is uh, Legally Mine. And I think there's a session that they have during uh, the, um, the, the uh, meeting this year. So uh, to start off, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Beiske. Um, Dr. Beiske is the president and um, uh, 
executive director of the American Board of Surgery. She started at the Board of Surgery back in 2006 and has served in uh, several roles at the board. She's additionally our surgical member at the uh, uh, on the board of uh, the American Board of Medical Specialties. Um, she remains clinically active. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania and focuses on minimally invasive surgery. She was the, along the line of my talk yesterday, she was the first uh, president of uh, SAGES um, and has had now encouraged other women to uh, have uh, led that uh, organization. Um, I'm extremely honored. She's a very, very, very busy woman. And I think we, I was last in line, <laughs> but because uh, <laughs> she had a, a huge schedule. She's been in San Diego, she's coming here and she's gonna be in Canada for the American too. So. I'm extremely honored that she accepted our invitation to provide the Thomas Orr uh, Memorial Lecture. So, Dr. Beiske. Well, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here uh, at this meeting. Um, many of the faces in this room are, are new to me, and that's one of the great joys of my job is being able to go around the country and meet surgeons everywhere. Uh, one of the reasons I chose to go into surgery as a medical student, because I actually liked every rotation that I did, uh, was that I really liked surgeons. Uh, and that, that feeling has played out for the rest of my career in, in, across this country, uh, internationally, people who are interested in surgery, people who go into surgery, uh, just an incredible community. Um, and I'm gonna use this talk as a little bit of a, a, a call to arms, but before I get there, uh, I want to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Dr. Albrecht, your president, for inviting me here. She was not last in line. I put her as first in line when she invited me. That's how that went. <laughs> uh, and for her service to the board as a director for six years, uh, in that era of time, being a director of the board meant that you gave 30 volunteer days away from home, giving exams, writing exams, and going to meeting for six years. So it was a significant uh, commitment on all kinds of levels. Uh, and I also wanna uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Dr. Kaups, your program director, who's currently a member of the council and the chair of the Trauma Burns Critical Care Board. Uh, and there are other people who've done a lot of work for the board in the room. I'm not gonna name everybody, uh, but it just, it speaks to the culture of volunteerism of surgeons. Uh, the commitment to the profession, the desire to give back, um, our ability to be effective in groups, in meetings. Uh, and I want to um, ask you, encourage you to learn the skills of doing that in a higher and better way so that we can be impactful across all of our communities. So for much of my career, in keeping with Dr. Albrecht's talk yesterday, I was the, uh, the N of one in the room, usually because I was the one woman in the room. And in more recent years, because I am sort of uh, out of the field of surgery in a lot of my meetings at the American Board of Medical Specialties, at the ACGME, with insurance companies, with hospital boards, I'm often the N of one, and that one is a surgeon. And I gotta tell you, they need more surgeons in the room. We need to be in more rooms. We need to be in rooms that have national leadership or local leadership on the medical level, but also we should be using our skills in our communities, you know, on your school board, on your club board, um, all the places that we can bring our skills. Surgeons excel at making impactful decisions on limited information in a changing environment. Uh, we're also really good at being team players, team leaders, and people look to us. It's always kind of it also makes me smile, at least internally, that, uh, you know, uh, internal medicine, for example, they have uh, 10 times or 15 times as many people practicing medicine in this country as, they, as uh, we do surgeons. Um, pediatrics, much bigger than we are. Emergency medicine, much bigger than we are. Family medicine, huge, you know, tenfold bigger than we are. But when I'm in the room, because I bear the mantle of surgery, not because I'm Joe Beiske, but because I bear the mantle of surgery, people listen to me. They want to know what I have to say. They always want me in the room and they always want you in the room too. So one of the things that I, uh, I've spent the last 30 years almost, I became chief of surgery at a, uh, uh, a hospital in Philadelphia in 1999, so 25 years. Uh, and that's when the sort of schism of being a practicing surgeon, a clinical surgeon, and also having to learn about administration and how to swim in those waters. And the skills are similar. Our essential nature leads us to that but they, they do require some learning. Uh, uh, the first couple of meetings I went to were full of acronyms, for example, titles, 
people who do uh, administration for a living like to use first names, you know, Mark will take care of that. We'll call Susan, like who's Mark? Who's Susan? You know, all the, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get the CIO. What's a CIO? CIO is the chief information officer. We have acronyms in medicine. They have a lot of acronyms in administration as well. So there's actually a lot to learn and a lot to learn about navigating the sort of politics um, of the role. So the point of this is to make sure that you have some of those tools, that you understand that those tools exist and don't just kind of um, sit there not using your best skills. I want you to use your skills to the highest and best level. Uh, and I want to say, actually, we had we underwent a big governance change at the American Board of Surgery about four years ago. Yeah, about four or five years ago now. And we had to constitute a new board. And I called each director that we had selected to sit on the new board and invited them. Most of them were surgeons. Two people were not. One was our public member, Karen Fisher, who's a lawyer and works for the AAMC. And the other was Mark Chasson, who's an internist, who was the CEO and president of the Joint Commission. And the only person who asked me what our strategic plan was, what our vision was, and to see our financial statements was Mark Chasson. Now, many of you may have sat on boards at all kinds of levels, and it was a huge surprise to our sitting board of directors, myself included, that the board of directors is responsible for those things. The board of directors is financially responsible for an organization. So anytime you agree to sit on a board, you should ask for those things. What's your strategy? What's your vision? What are your finances? Because you're now responsible once you become a director. So I have nothing to disclose except for my job. So let's just sort of tell a story. So you are uh, a member of this society or another society. You finally get invited to sit on a committee. You're really excited about it or you're young, you know, you're advancing in your career and you finally get invited to sit on a hospital committee. Um, very excited, you show up, you know, get there early, whether on Zoom or actually at the meeting, you get yourself a cup of coffee, you sit down and you wait. And people start kind of drifting into the room. They're all saying hi to each other. They're hugging each other. You're, you're the news person. You don't really know anybody. They're talking. They're getting some food. They sit down. And the meeting starts about 10 minutes late. Over the, as the meeting starts to get going, the chair says, OK, I guess we'll get started. I think everybody here knows each other. They approve the minutes. The chair goes through a couple of agenda items. After about 10 minutes, the reports are all done. And the chair asks if there's any new business. And people start raising their hand and bringing up new topics. They want to know about things that have been done before. They start to talk simultaneously. People ask about new developments from old projects. Other people talk about how they want it, you know, they want a new initiative that no one's been paying attention to. Two or three people keep their hands up and just keep their hands up while other people are talking. They kind of wave their hands and then they insert themselves into the conversation. In Zoom, they start either talking over each other or they start talking in the chat. Um, so the conversation is going on at multiple different levels uh, and it just kind of happens. After a while, some of the people who've had their hands up, they put them down. Either their arm got tired, somebody said what they had to say, the conversation moved on and it didn't really pertain anymore. We'll never know. We'll never know what those people were gonna say because they were kind of cut out of the conversation by everybody else who was more aggressive, who had a more intense agenda, who cared a little bit more. The chair calls in a couple of people with their hands up. Um, uh, and at which point people who start uh, start being interested in the conversation start to chime in, over talk each other and interrupt. Kind of goes on and on. You start to lose some of the interest of the people of the room who are less, um, less intent. They start to pull out their phones. They switch their laptops over to their email, maybe even to Facebook. Anybody here not been guilty of that? I would like to meet you. We can talk in the back and join our board. <laughs> Some of the people who never raised their hands have really just sort of folded up their arms and gone and gone away. The chair says, uh, we don't have a scheduled break. Anybody who needs a bio break, which is a term I find really offensive and weird. Uh, anyone who needs a bio break, just leave when you need to and come on back when you don't want to, when you're ready. People get up, they leave, they linger in the back of the room, they talk to each other. There's still sort of a meeting going on. Then about 10 minutes after the meeting was supposed to end, the chair thanks everyone, says it was a good discussion, says that they'll follow up um, with some of the agenda items and that's the end of the meeting. I just wanna know if that sounds familiar to anybody. Anybody been in a meeting like that? Everybody been in a meeting like that? I'm talking about volunteers for the most part here. So that is not how we want to use our time. So this is sort of a split. If you're a person who runs these organizations, who runs these meetings, that's not the way you want them to be. 
If you're a person who's joining an organization or sitting at these meetings, be aware. You want to use your volunteer time wisely. You want to use your time where it can be effective. So if you find yourself in a meeting like that, kind of think twice. Think about whether you can change the culture or have the opportunity for impact or whether maybe you want to use your volunteer time uh, better somewhere else. So we can do better than creating the Tower of Babel uh, at all of our meetings and all of our conferences. So at the ABS, we get a lot of visitors, a lot of visitors internationally. We actually have one of the most superb um, certification processes in the world. A lot of countries, even sort of our peer countries, don't actually have any particular certification progress. You have your training process, rather. You have your training. You're done with your training. You are therefore this type of doctor, kind of a, you know, a spit and a handshake uh, and a pat in the back and you're done. So no final assessment, no organized assessment. In, uh, in the Netherlands, actually, the trainees are responsible for their own training. They decide that they want to do more hepatobiliary surgery uh, as residents, then they apply to go to one of the other hospitals in the country, small country, you can drive everywhere uh, or ride a bike everywhere. Um, uh, but there's no sort of concluding event and more and more there's pressure from the public and from governance to have standards. So they come here to learn about how we've set our standards and we talk about our exams, we talk about our questions. And at some point they say, how did you get all these questions? Because we have literally thousands of questions in our item in, in our item bank. We say, well, they're written by volunteers. And they go, uh, and they say, well, how, how, how do you get people to volunteer for that? So, well, you know, the surgeons are sort of committed to the profession. Um, you know, they're committed to the public and the interests of the profession. So they choose to volunteer. That's how they choose to spend their time. And actually for the board, it's kind of prestigious. People vie for the opportunity to serve the board. And they literally, their jaws drop. And this has happened over and over again, at which point they almost always say, uh, we can't duplicate that. <laughs> Can we buy your questions? Uh, and we say, no, we never let them buy our questions, just so you know. So we have over 1,200 volunteers. And I take their time. I take that very, very seriously. I want them to be satisfied. I want them to get uh, you know, the feeling of having served. I want them to have the networking opportunities that we've been talking about at this meeting. I want them to see a path towards advancement. Uh, and most of all, I, I want to make good use of their time. You all have, I don't think I counted this, but let's say 11 committees. You also have a council. So if I were going to be conservative and say, oh, there's maybe eight people on a committee, maybe a few more on the council, you've got about 100 volunteers serving the society at any given time. And every year, a couple people roll off and a couple more people roll on. So this impacts uh, a tremendous amount of the, uh, of the organization. So how do you make the best use of people's time? And how do you make, how do you serve the best interests of the organization? It starts with who's sitting at the table. Who's on that committee? Why did you get on that committee? Did you end up there because you raised your hand? Did you end up there because you were someone's, um, you know, sister's partner? Um, did you end up there because I don't know why? But two of the, two of the deadly sins of governance are governance by representation. Um, uh, I'll start with just one. I'll tell you the, the seven deadly sins later, but representation. So when you're putting together a group, resist the temptation to say, well, um, if it's a hospital group, the chair of medicine should be there. We should have the chair of medicine there and we should have you know, uh, uh, someone from radiology there. Instead, we work by competencies. What are the skill sets we need in this committee to get the work of the committee done? It's important to define what the work is, but once you know what the work is, what are the skill sets we need to get this done? So at the council level, which is really the sort of great think tank of the board, consists of about 30 surgeons, uh, Dr. Dent in the audience, Dr. Angelos in the audience, Dr. Kalps in the audience, all on the council. So a diverse representation, Dr. Fahey, <laughs> Fahey Shendo, um, uh, uh, a diverse representation of specialties, geography, uh, age distribution, other demographics, and critically, expertise. So we have a massive grid, it doesn't fit on a slide. Uh, the names of the counselors, the list of the competencies that we seek, they have to have some experience in exam development. So ideally they've served as an item writer, not all of them. I wanna say this is a, a, an amalgam. So some of the people on the council should have these skills. And overall, we should embody all these skills ideally um, and all the people on the council. They should have some experience and practice improvement. Some of the things that aren't on these lists are sort of personal ones, which include someone from community practice or several people from community practice, some people who've done extensive research, um, people who are familiar now with artificial intelligence would be a really great skill set for us to have to inform the discussion. And what we stay away from is saying, we need the chair of the education committee from the SSO. 
Um, you don't want to say a specific job or a specific individual. We might want to say we want someone who's familiar with the education that the education processes that they're using from that society. But you have to keep your mind open. Who are the best skills? That'll bring you the most interesting group of people at the table. You also want some important uh, personal characteristics, and in that I'll include all the demographics that we think are critical. Um, but the true personal characteristics are people who are actually reliable. Um, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm asked to give talks on leadership, people say, how do you get there? I'm like, be reliable. You know, from your first committee appointment, whether you're interested in it or not, if you agreed to do it, do it right. Show up on time. Don't be the person who like packs your bag, you know, 20 minutes before the end of the meeting. the whole meeting, listen to what the assignments are, do them and show up at the next meeting. It actually works. Um, people respect that in our field. Be amiable. You should be able to disagree without being disagreeable. Disagreement is key in all these, right? You don't want everybody at the table with the same opinion. You want actually a diversity of opinions. And one of the smart things to bring into a room is someone that you know disagrees with the, with the path that you're going to take. So you have an outsider. So you have someone who can show you the flaws in your thinking. So you're not just in sort of your own think tank. But you should be able to do it in a way that you're still talking to each other when you leave the room. So able to disagree without being disagreeable. Discreet, not tweeting out in the middle of a meeting. Um, what you're talking about for the rest of the world to see before it's been decided. Uh, so agree on the level of discretion. I've been in meetings where, uh, where the agreement was that we wouldn't talk about anything in that room once we left the room, including during bio breaks. Um, so you weren't going out to lunch and talking about it. All the discussion was being held in that room where everybody could hear, no silos, no pairing up, no backstabbing, no tweeting. Um, all, the only conversation was, if you're going to say it, say it out loud in the room or don't say it at all. And then loyal. If you're on one of these groups, you know, the, the temptation, if a vote goes against you, is to go back outside to the rest of the world and say, you know, I don't know what they were thinking. I told them it was the worst idea in the world and I voted against it. That's not the way forward for getting work done. You have to state that opinion uh, while you're in the room. Uh, and then you have to be willing to accept if the group goes against you and no light between our shoulders when you step outside the room. This is the direction we're going. This is the work we've decided. This is what we've agreed upon to do. So no light between the shoulders, uh, loyalty. When we have to make hard decisions um, or impactful decisions at the board, we like to rely on setting principles. It's the high level. It's the not getting stuck in, um, but how? You know, How are we gonna make these changes? So that, that occurs when we have um, you know, sort of difficult or unexpected events, and also when we're trying to you know, make big changes. So for a difficult or unexpected event, COVID. Um, we, wanted, we weren't sure what to do with our exams. We couldn't bring people into Pearson centers because they were shut down, but also even if the few of them that were open, um, we didn't feel like we could, as a healthcare organization or a para-healthcare organization, ask people to go into a crowded room to take subways, um, to take elevators at the peak of COVID in July of that first year. Our oral exams, we couldn't have people flying into Philadelphia. We couldn't have three people in an exam room. 60 people in an orientation room. So we weren't sure what to do. So we sat down and we talked about what are the things that we want to accomplish um, uh, on behalf of the profession and our young professionals regarding certification. So as a healthcare organization, we'll do our part to protect the public and our constituents from the virus. That's a principle. The decision that made out of that, we therefore all meetings exam would have to be virtual. Now this sounds really obvious at the time, but it was like mind blowing. Um, uh, when we were talking about this in March and April of 2020. We also decided as much as possible, all candidate certification timelines should be kept intact. We wanted people to be able to advance in their careers. If they were going on to their fellowships, we wanted them to get their general surgery certification done so they could focus on their specialty. If they were finishing their specialty, we wanted them to be able to move on. We know that people are more likely to pass our exams uh, the, the closer to their training. Uh, they take them. So we didn't want them to delay. And we felt like it was an important professional milestone. So agree or disagree, that's what we all decided. When we left the room, we all said it with one voice. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to march forward. Therefore, we decided to give the exams virtually. Some of that we came later on to regret, but we never regretted the decision making around it because it was sound and we all agreed to it. And the third principle, all solutions for examinations and for ABS meetings would need to be provided equi equitably uh, to all candidates. So a lot of people were like, well, for the oral exam, just have them go to, to their chair's office 
um, you know, and we'll give a virtual exam there. So not everybody has a chair, not everyone can get there. Not every hospital would allow a, a past trainee to come in. Not everyone was going into a job. Some people were going into, um, you know, into research years or taking time off, uh, or they were fellows whose chair office were they gonna do? So we didn't wanna set up a, a process that wasn't going to be the same for everyone. That is a, a key feature of the board, the you know, standards same for everyone. Uh, so we weren't gonna try any of these sort of one-off solutions. Most people will be able to do it this way. So those are the principles. Those were what set our guiding decisions for maintaining all of our exams going forward. It was a hard period. Um, and I think that now that it's behind us, it worked. And then at a higher level and under less crunch, um, uh, when we redesigned our governance, we split off a board, uh, a 13 member board that was responsible for the finances, the strategy um, uh, and the mission of the organization. And then we had this think tank of the council uh, and what were, how are we gonna do this? What was the purpose? What was the purpose of the change? Uh, and so we made up a list of principles. And one of them was that the council serves the American Board of Surgery and consists of specialty board and board of directors by providing input into current issues in surgery. The council will adhere to best practices in governance. That means competency-based nominations, diverse group of people at the table following Robert's rules of or order. The council will at all times be mission focused. The council will be self-selecting, no appointees, another best practice. So we had this whole list. And once you have a list, things start to fall in place for how you actually um, want to make things run. So you can apply those kind of principles to anything, right? So I just made up an education committee. What would be the principles of a committee that you're sitting on for Southwest Surgical or a committee you're sitting on in your hospital or a committee that you're sitting on for your, your local school district? Um, so these are just throw out principles. And actually when you sit down to form principles, that's where you start. Everybody says, what is, what is the purpose of this committee? This committee should be, and you just do blue sky, 30,000 foot thinking. Everybody sort of throws out ideas and you'll find that the ideas start to kind of clump together or iterate together. Um, and it doesn't take very long before they come together as a group. So the purpose of this committee or the, the nature of this committee, the essence of this committee is that it respects the times of the volunteers. That suggests you're gonna start on time and finish on time, that you're gonna schedule meetings with enough advanced time that people can actually make them. You're gonna have an agenda and you're gonna be organized. That it strives to hear all voices and opinions in the room. This is something I feel very, very strongly about. And we're gonna actually go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, is efficient while still allowing conversation, meets best practices and meeting management, values diverse experience, that means bringing diverse people to the table, um, is competency-based, I feel strongly about that at all times, has a clear agenda, clear short and long-term goals, you know what you're trying to get done this year, you know what you're trying to get done out of this meeting. Meetings should finish up with some takeaways. What are the action items out of this meeting? What are we going to talk about next time? That's how you make forward progress. If you don't know where you're trying to get, how do you know how you're gonna get there? At a higher level, there's some sort of additional meeting uh, principles. The highest one, respecting the time of the volunteers, hearing all of the voices. Hmm, that's funny, I think this slide is the same one. Forgive that failure of deletion. There we go, these are the higher levels. Train your chairs. Don't just assume that because someone has sat in a committee, that they can run a committee really well. We talked about this a little bit at the, um, uh, the GME breakfast yesterday. Don't just assume that because someone was taught to do surgery, that they can teach surgery. Don't just assume because you've sat on a board that you can lead a board. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people be like, we've been on all, all kinds of boards. You know, We've sat on all kinds of committees. Yeah, and a lot of them didn't work that well, right? So make sure that you train the chairs, that they understand the sort of rules and the culture of the organization. Always make sure that you introduce everyone at the meeting. Uh, you know, I was a little bit of, a, of an outsider for the first half of my career. And I would sit down in meetings and the chair would go, I assume everybody here knows everybody. Um, and I didn't want to raise my hand and go, well, I don't. <laughs> you know, could, you, could you have everybody introduce themselves? So just set a level with sort of respectful playing field, unless it's a small group that meets all the time and you know, you know, you know that everybody knows each other. Just make the assumption that it's useful to introduce people always. Not a bad idea to have icebreakers, a little bit of fun injected in a place where people are sitting at a table or sitting in front of their cameras. You know, what's your favorite food? What'd you have for lunch yesterday? What's your favorite season? Just something to help people get to know each other because culture matters. Getting to know each other and getting to be friends and having some affection and some common ground is really helpful. And the last one is be mindful of attribution um, because in the scenario where some people are waving their hands around and some people are talking over people, it's pretty common for uh, a quieter person 
to make a really good, thoughtful and important point and have that lost in the milieu, but have it picked up again later on by someone else who may not have heard it, who may have heard it and sort of internalized it. And it's really important if that happens as the chair to say, that's exactly what Kay said earlier. Um, I'd like to hear more of that, about that from, you know, from Kay. So make sure that people get credit for their thinking and it's not just the most um, vigorous or aggressive, aggressive people in the room. So meeting, meeting hygiene. I thought about titling this talk, Organizational Effectiveness or Meeting Hygiene, and then I figured that you would all stay out there. Um, but, but also, or and also, uh, it's a little bit like Al Capone, you know, he was incredibly, uh, you know, vivid, larger than life, criminal mastermind, um, but what brought him down was his taxes. So uh, it turns out that like, sometimes the most basic things are the most important to pay attention to if you wanna really be effective. So I put the ABS mission statement up because as a culture, um, by habit and tradition, we start every single meeting we have at every single level by reading the mission statement. So that helps to focus you. Why are we here? So this is the mission statement of the American Board of Surgery. It has, the core of it has been the same since 1937, uh, which is that we serve the patients and society in the specialty of surgery. Uh, and always since 1937, the patients have been first, which I think sometimes surprises people. It's not to serve the surgeons, it is to serve the surgeons, but it's always to serve the patients first. So as you make decisions, if you've just read that, you can remember if there's a sort of schism in which direction to go, okay, or mission is to serve the patients and the profession uh, and the specialty of surgery. Is this in line with that or have we fallen afoul? So we start every meeting, um, by, meeting by reading the mission statement. And when I say train the chairs, um, there should be a sort of, these are the rules. This is the culture as we see it. This is the way that we think it's best to be effective. So a standardized kind of a standardized meeting statement, start by reading the mission statement. Some of our specialty boards or committees will also read their own charter, or charter is too long, but their own sort of focus and mission statement. The chair owns the meeting, they're responsible. I was recently at a meeting that really just went amok um, and got actually kind of offensive. And afterwards I approached the chair and said, you know, I, I wish that you had attended to this. And he said, well, I'm not their parent. <laughs> I was like, you're the chair, you're in charge of the meeting. That's how it's supposed to go. So the chair sets the tone of the meeting. So I start by saying, uh, ask the room or decide yourself if you're the chair, whether you're gonna use first names or whether you're gonna use honorifics. Is everyone gonna get called doctor or is everyone gonna get called Joe or some variation on Joe? Um, uh, and then use it because there's a very subtle distinction between who gets the titles and who doesn't. And it's not just the one we all know where you know, uh, sort of more senior people tend to get the title and more junior people tend to get the, um, the first name, but it's also a little bit of an in-club, out-club thing. So uh, you've probably been at society meetings, someone steps up to the podium and the big professor at the front of the table goes, Tim, that means they know Tim, Tim's their friend, right? And you step up to the podium and they're like, person in the back. Uh, <laughs> so uh, load level, start the meeting just by deciding that, no judgment, which way you wanna go, just have everybody agree. Set the ground rules for speaking. So uh, since I uh, started organizing the ABS, we have nameplates at every meeting, little paper, trifold things. And the way that you let people know you wanna speak is you turn it up on its side. It's quiet, you don't have to keep your hand in the air. Um, you don't get a chance to wave it. You can't pick up your nameplate and wave it around. You just pick it up, turn it on your side. The chair sort of makes notice and they walk their way through the crowd, um, calling upon each person. When you're, when you're done, turn your nameplate back down. You don't wanna make a bunch of nameplates, probably not that ecologically sound. You can still set a rule. If you don't have them as the chair, the next best practice is to make a list. You see 14 people's hands go up, that's too many, let's say four. Um, and then you can sort of reassure the room. Um, you can say, you know, Kevin, then Susan, then Clay, then Claire. Uh, and then once you've called on Kevin, you say the next list of four so that people are calm and they can listen. If you're sitting there worried, like, I wanna say what I wanna say. Oh no, the conversation has gone on. Oh no, they've made, made their point, made my point. You're not really listening. You're not really fully engaged. So that habit of like knowing that you're gonna have a chance to talk, knowing that you're not gonna be overridden um, is incredibly helpful uh, to, good, to good meeting hygiene. Try to use gender neutral language. Try to use language that doesn't have any history of racism. I'll tell you a little um, useful tip. We changed um, 
uh, we changed the term, the grandfather clause. We had a lot of grandfather clauses at the American Board of Surgery, um, things that happened before certain boards were certified. And I was like, oh, we shouldn't say grandfather. We should say grandparent. That's more inclusive. So I was sort of pleased with that. We scrubbed grandfather off of all of our websites and all of our conversation. And actually someone on Twitter noticed that we had done that. And they were like, hats off the American Board of Surgery for using grandparents instead of um, uh, grandfather. And someone else chimed in and said, the, grand, the grandfather clause uh, has its legacies in the re period of the reconstruction where there was an attempt to prevent um, uh, free black people from voting. So the original rule was you couldn't vote if you couldn't read. But then it turned out that a lot of white people in the South couldn't read either. <laughs> so the new rule was you can't vote unless you can read or your grandfather could vote. So that was the discrimination. So just a little, you know, when you use grandfather, some people's, some, so the hair on the back of some people's necks goes up for different reasons. We switched to legacy. So there's racism embedded in our language, but there's a lot of gender embedded in our language. And I will just make a plea. The word guys does not include everyone in the room. You might think it does. It really doesn't. So there's a ton of other language. I've switched to y'all. Um, you can say people. You can say, <laughs> you can say surgeons. Um, you can say, you know, uh, uh, good citizens. Uh, there's actually some very funny word clouds about all the other options, but pick something else. Often the plural works or the title works. Surgeons, committee members, audience, attendees. Try to stick to gender neutral language. And we try to keep it light. I always say, you know, I slip up sometimes. I do di um, digress to guys sometimes and ask people to remind me, point it out, help me out, make me better. Other ground rules, this isn't a debate and it's not a win-lose in a committee. It shouldn't be a back and forth, a back and forth, a back and forth. You don't get to like drive your point down by saying it over and over again. And it's entirely legitimate, especially in a one hour meeting to say that everybody gets to comment on one topic only once. So if you say, I don't think we should do this and here's why, and someone else says, well, I think we shouldn't hear why, you don't get to say, well, no, 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 I think, that's not the point. Everybody makes their statement once. Everybody gets to sort of cogitate upon it. You can come back again, but turning a meeting into sort of a free for all of letting everybody argue isn't helpful. So you can establish a rule which just says everybody on this topic that we're about to talk about, everybody gets to say thing once, say something once, and it also makes people really think about what they're gonna say. Agree ahead of time whether you're gonna rule, uh, use Robert's rules. Most people don't actually understand Robert's rules. But if you're gonna use them, you should learn them, you know, first, second motion, vote. And also decide whether the meeting is confidential because they are taught with. Sometimes we do want people to be tweeting things out. Sometimes we do want them to leave the room and go get other opinions, but everybody should know um, at the beginning and at the end of the meeting, whether or not that that's allowable and then stick to it. What can we do as organizations now that you've got you know, the right people in the room and you've given them their best opportunity to bring their best selves, their best opportunity to do really good work, what organizations need to do is really is provide support. Um, a lot of volunteer societies rely heavily on the volunteers themselves to schedule meetings, to take minutes, to take notes. If you're a group that can afford to do that, it's really important to have staff liaisons. They end up being the subject matter experts over time. If you were the staff liaison to the Education Committee for a Society for 15 years, you know it pretty well. They can really rely on you and use you as a resource. Um, help them figure out the principles when they get into a sticky point, a sticky moment in any committee meeting um, or a topic that they don't know how to handle, encourage them to create principles, help them create principles. What is it? What is the why? Why are you doing this thing? The rest will fall into place afterwards. Offer the group, if they're the experts in this area, they're supposed to be, make them the true experts. Um, uh, encourage them to get some education. That doesn't necessarily mean going to a meeting, find meeting, reading material for them so they can take a deeper dive. Uh, into whatever it is that they're working on. Everybody's got a DEI committee now. Help the DEI committee get educated. Don't just assume that the people in the room know everything. Um, you know, provide with, with them with an opportunity to meet with other groups. Provide them with an opportunity to go to conferences. Help them be the subject matter experts. And then the last one is empowerment. If a committee is doing the work, doing the deep dive into this material, again, how many of you have been on a committee, spent two years working on something, <laughs> Uh, brought it forward to a big room of people to the board uh, and everybody legislated everything all over again. Well, did you think of, well, what about, well, uh, this should be the word were and not where um, the sort of revisiting of everything in a, in a, in a board meeting 
um, is disrespectful to the people who've done a deep dive into it and also a terrible use of everyone's time. You can't be everywhere all the time. You can't make every decision all the time. You have to trust the people with you work with, that you work with. So I'll share with you, we actually have this codified or by law 3.2A3 specifies that the director should rely in good faith on information from other sources, including a committee of the board upon which the director doesn't serve. So you weren't there for the conversation. You have to just trust that the people that you trust, the people on your committees, the people in your society and your organization that have chosen to serve are good people and they've done good work. That the director reasonably believes to merit confidence that you can rely on those decisions and you should. So that's our empowerment statement. We have empowered committees, they bring it to the table. We accept it unless we have really strong reason not to. So what if you're the person in charge? should set up a system that rewards good people, that attracts them, that makes them feel valued, that, know, that they know that if they cut something short that they're doing right now to go to a meeting, the meeting's going to start, it's going to have purpose, they're going to be able to state what they want to do, they're going to understand what the goals are, uh, and they're going to be able to, uh, to finish with a feeling of satisfaction. Support them with staff if you can, empower them, trust their decisions, listen to them when they make them, and basically just make the highest and best use of their time. I learned all this from the directors themselves, from all the volunteers who work at the board, the 1,200 people, actually at a recent count, it was 1,400 across all kinds of variables. Some of them come for a day. Um, some of them do all of their work virtually. Um, some of them still give you know, 25 or more days a year uh, of work, writing tests, giving tests, setting standards in education, continuing certification. So thanks to all of them. Thanks to all of you. Even just coming to a meeting like this is volunteering your time, participating in the community, advancing the profession, um, sharing your knowledge and your companionship um, and your story with others. So thanks to all of you. Uh, and thank you for giving me the privilege of the stage. Oh, oh, a medal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much.